filled back up and getting ready for the rest of the day, getting ready for the rest of the week to be able to go back on the things that we have gotten, to go back over some things that we have learned, to reapply the things that we have learned. So we thank God for yet another opportunity. So tonight as we get ready to endeavor to get into our lesson tonight, I want to open up in the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Is where I want us to open up tonight. It's where I believe that God is leading me to open us up tonight as we continue dealing with the attributes of growing in grace. Our opening scripture tonight will be found in the book of Isaiah chapter number 1. We're going to begin with verse number 7. We're going to read down to verse number 20 for our opening. Isaiah chapter 1, beginning at verse 7, and we're going to end off at verse 21. Verse 20, rather. So we thank God, and we, we want to look at these attributes because it's important. We've been dealing with introduction to the Bible. We dealt with part 1. We've been dealing with part 2 in... We want to build ourselves. We want to be at a place to where we're not just coming to church to say that we have a place to say that we have a place to say, a place to say that we have a place to say that's our church. And I purposely, repetitively repeated myself because, you know, it's one thing to have a church, a church home, be at a church, be a part of a church. It's another thing to live as the church. Is that making any sense? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to go to worship week after week, to participate in the praise that should lead up to worship because we cannot engage in the worship of God until we have prepared ourselves through prayer, engage in praise. Praise is the final preparation to worship because worship is where God ushers into his presence. It's not us allowing God to come into ours because God is always all around us. Is that right? That's right? He's an omnipresent God. And that doesn't mean because he's omnipresent doesn't mean that we are always in his presence. Doesn't mean that he always allow us in his presence. He's a very present. He's always present. He's ever present, but that doesn't mean he's present in everything that we do. He's around everything that we do and it's understood. But do we allow God to really get involved in everything that we do? So worship is where we recognize the worship of God. And when we recognize the worship of God, that means we've gotten totally out of ourselves because now it's not about us being able to articulate, not being so grandeur about what we're doing, so good about how we're doing it. It's not about how well we present what it is that we're doing, but it's about the presentation that is pleasing to God. Is that right? That's right. That's why one writer said, as he pinned down and God had him to pin down and he was moved by the Spirit of God, that he said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight, O God. That's what the writer said, right? That's what the psalmist said when he pinned it down because it wasn't so much that the writer was so good or that the praiser or that the prayer was so good or that they were so worthy of it, but they wanted to find out that God was pleased by what they were doing because it wasn't about being seen by everybody else right. when you have put yourself in a position of prayer prayer preps the mind to get ready to praise mm -hmm. what does that have to do with growing in grace because as we growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we understand how to stand. We understand what it means to stand. We understand what it means to continue to go forward. We recognize how to continue to propel ourselves forward. And we don't look so much on the person that has faltered, that is faltering, but we get there to restore them from the fault. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. So Isaiah, chapter number one, beginning at verse seven. God bless you. This is where we're opening up tonight. Everybody have it? Yes. You find these words. He says, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, your, your land, strangers devour it in your presence. 
and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers and the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers as a besieged city except the Lord of hosts had left us unto a very small round and we should be we should have been as Sodom and even and we should have been like unto Gomorrah Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of, fe of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who have required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incense in abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I have cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hated. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make your prayer, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of our God shall stand forever. We just read verses 7 through verse 20 in the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Let us bow here briefly for a moment of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, we come tonight. Father, we come now in the name of Jesus. We come humble and submissive. We come tonight, God, asking once again that at this very hour, this very moment, that God individually as well as corporately, God, those of us that are present, those of us that have had a desire to be present, those of us, God, that are watching and those that will watch tonight, God, we pray now that you were creating us a clean heart. You were renewing us a right spirit. God, you know our motive. You know our purpose for assembling week after week. God, you know our purpose for assembling tonight. And God, as we come tonight, we come in the humblest fashion as we know. We come, God, humble because we remove ourselves. We remove our thoughts because we recognize that our thoughts are not your thoughts. We remove our ways because we recognize that our ways are not like unto your ways. They're as far as the east is from the west, as far as the earth is from the heaven. God, we pray now in the name of Jesus that you will look upon us with an eye pity, but a heart full of compassion, and that tonight you will allow your spirit to be present with us tonight. God, we know that you're an omnipotent God. We know that you're omniscient. We know that you're omnipresent. And we need your presence tonight. We need you, God. We ask tonight, God, that both cooperate as well as individually, that you would deal with each of us tonight. Yes. That you will move upon us tonight. That you will speak to each of us tonight. That you, God, will open up our minds. That you will open up our ears. That you will open up our heart. That you will give us an understanding. That your spirit tonight will have its way. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. In these earthen vessels, God. In this sanctuary, God. In these earthen sanctuaries to have your way. We pray tonight, God, that your spirit will not only move and not only speak. But you will open up our eyes, God. Our natural eyes. That we will be able to see our spiritual eyes that we will grasp the understanding of what you allow these natural eyes to see. You will open up these natural minds that we will be able to grasp the understanding of what is said in our spiritual mind that we will be able to apply it unto wisdom as you yes. give us the knowledge for what your world has to say. God have that own way tonight. God not only in this place but even through the airways tonight that that what is said in this place not only sink and regulate in our heart but God let it apply to every area, every young, every world as every old God, every middle age God no matter who we are, what our age is, but open us up to be able to receive tonight. Let us be receptive. Let us be ground that not only your seed and your word falling, but water us as the seed fall yes. and cause us to grow it even as it falls to the ground. And God, we be careful to give your name glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. we pray. Amen. Yes, Lord. 
Amen. We thank God again. We have been dealing with this lesson on growing in grace. We've been dealing with growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have been dealing with this from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Let me go there real quick because we're talking about the attributes of growing in grace. And I want to go back over some of those things tonight. But I want to go and read our foundational scripture, one of our foundational scriptures for this lesson tonight, 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse 17 and 18. And if you will go there with me real quick, I'll read it as you're trying to find it. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17 and verse 18, because it's imperative, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside, it doesn't matter what the pigmentation of your skin is, what does matter, what is important is that the content of your mind, the content of your heart is changed by the conviction of the Holy Spirit as the Word of God is not only read and heard in your hearing, but the application of that same word to every area of your life. And I'm going to show you some of those things in the word tonight. So 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. And when you look at this third chapter of Peter's letter that he wrote, this epistle of Peter, as he wrote his apologetic letter to the body, as he wrote his apologetic letter to the churches, as he wrote his apologetic letter to the believers, as he wrote his apologetic letter unto all those that will come into the knowledge of who Jesus Christ was, he wanted to not only continue to affirm their faith, but he wanted to reassure them that if they hold fast, if they continue, if they stood their ground in spite of what was going on in the present day in the first century church that the believers even thereafter could pattern their lives because things were only advanced even though times look like they have changed we've only fitted ourselves to the times in which we live because there are advancement that continue to grow because man began to become more knowledgeable he began to become more intelligent and in his intelligence he made things to fit him to be better to make life much easier for him or her. Is that right? That's right. But in that, he not only became wiser, as Jesus said, but he became weaker. He became, she became weaker in their faith because moral standards begin to change because we believe the onset of the coming of the Son of God for the second time was still yet a for all. It had been being taught then as it is now. People have been by being diverted from their faith to believe that Jesus had already come and there's no need to be worried about him coming again, that we're living in a place and time, we're under uh, the place and time of, of the tribulation and those things that people have misconstrued, but let me help us understand that it has not yet come, but yet some folk have heard, some folk have fallen, some folk have been poor, some folk have been put out of place, as Paul said to the church at Galatia, they have been bewitched. Uh -huh. In other words, somebody have put and cast a spell over their minds, some folk have been completely convinced that there's no need to believe anymore. Some folk have been put at a place that they don't have to grow any further. Some folk have been put at a place in a position in their minds that it's all right to do whatever, live any kind of way, stay in whatever lifestyle. It's all right to sin as much as I want. As long as I ask God for forgiveness, he will forgive me. Let me help us all understand God will forgive us, but he also will turn us over to the thing that we enjoy more than we enjoy him if we continue to stay in it no matter who we are. It doesn't matter what your anointing is. It doesn't matter what your calling is. It doesn't matter what your ministry is. You are not entitled to be a part of those that in the number that will live with the Lord forever and be in the presence of God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit forever if we continue in the things that are sinful. Right. Am I making sense to anybody. Yes. He never said that until he come you will not sin anymore. He said you should gain the strength that sin should no longer easily have the power over you anymore. Uh -huh. Growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gets you to the place that you no longer let the same game be played on you. And if the game is played on you, that means we need to go back and reapply the lesson so that we don't play the same game or be played by the same game over and over again. But sometimes we like the game that's being played, but we'll play the game and put the game on somebody else and then instead of accepting responsibility for where we are, what we did, why we did it, the reason why we engaged 
in it. Why we was enjoying it? Because we like the enjoyment and the pleasure of it, but we don't want the responsibility for the part that we play because we put it off on somebody else. Right. Growing in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, bringing to the place of not only accountability and responsibility, as one of our previous lessons talked about, but it keeps you from being so easily becoming gullible all the time. Am I making sense? Yes. So Peter says here, as he wrote to the body, as he wrote to the Christian believers, as he wrote to the believers in his day, that was heretics in his day. In other words, heretic was somebody, let me put it to a, in a simple term, they were somebody that heard something, that they was easily persuaded by something, they was easily brought out of something, they was easily put into something, they were put in a position that they wanted you to believe what they wanted you to believe by the standards in which they brought it by, and they was easily able to catch your mind because it was something that you could see for your and because you saw that to be real and to be true, you ran with it? Yeah. He said, she said, they say, and they uh -huh. went on then. Heretics had their own style of religion, their own style of belief. They had their own style or their own purpose of why they taught certain things concerning who the person of Christ is, was, and will always be. Right. So Peter says here, he said, Yea, therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your steadfastness. He said, Listen, I want you to understand that people will gradually bring you to the place to make you believe that it's all right to, to continue to stay where you are. It's all right to take your taste every now and then. You, 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 you know, understand that the world standards say that you're only an alcoholic after the first taste, but as long as you don't do it in front of people because the Bible. The Bible say it's not what you do, but it's how you do it. If the Bible say, you know, you 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 let me put it like this here, they, they will take the scripture and they will misconstrue it in the in the fact or the facet that if meat offend my brother, I won't eat meat. Because Paul said, if it offend you for me to eat the sacrifice that have been sacrificed unto idols, although I don't believe in the idol that it was sacrificed to, I'm eating the meat because I choose to eat the meat. And now that you're coming into salvation, you don't understand what's going on. But but you're thinking that I'm a partaker of it, then what I'm going to do, I'm not going to eat it in front of you. Well, you understand that according to the law, now believers even in this day, Paul said, he said unto his son, Timothy, he will look, there's something that's going to take you to abstain from certain meats. Well, you don't like the poor, and you said that God said that we can't eat pork, because under the law, that's what it said, so you won't eat no pork. Well, I'm going to tell you what, since you don't like it and it offends you, then I'm going to eat my pork chop when you ain't around. Right. I'm going to give you some pork, some pork rolls when you're in the round. This ain't to offend nobody, but this is what happened because we misconstrued things. So in other words, if it offend you to see me take a drink of Jack Daniels, then what I'm going to do in the confinement of my home, I'm going to drink it. If you don't like the fact that I get drunk, then as long as I get drunk at home, am I making sense to anybody? Yeah. And it goes on and on in other areas. So he said, steadfastness. In other words, you know the faith that draws you in. You know what it was that caused you to believe. You understood that by the word of faith, the word concerning Jesus Christ coming down through 42 generations, being born of the Virgin Mary, being born in the city of Bethlehem, performing the miracles that he performed, you knew who he was. You knew the fact that he died. You understood that he was both God and man at the same time. You knew that he died out on a cross. You understood the purpose of him dying. You recognized that he was the promised Messiah, not only according to scripture, but he fit who he's supposed to be and what he was. He was the final high priest patterned after Melchizedek after the order of God and his priesthood lasts forever. Uh-huh. You understood that. So I need you to stand fast. He said, in other words, look, hardship don't come. You ain't gonna have everything that you need. Because you're a believer, they're going to cut some things out. They're going to try to make you deny your faith in God through Christ, because of Christ. They're going to try to make you believe that you are not hearing from God. And then they're going to make you think that what you heard from God, that you only heard it in your head. And they're going to try to medicate you to make you believe that you lost your mind. Uh -huh. Come on, y'all, talk to me. So growing in grace, Peter wanted them to understand you got to be steadfast. He said, some of y'all going to fall away from the faith. Some of y'all have been turned from the faith. Some of y'all going to be given over to fables. Some of y'all going to have nursery rhymes preached to you. You're going to believe the nursery rhyme before you believe the truth of God. 
Well, God loved me just like I am. He said, come as you are. So here now, the word says that it's all right to still dress like you want to dress and come into God's house perpetrating as well as portraying worldliness while you try to possess godliness. Uh -huh. Chastity simply means that you change your attire. It's all right to love the way you look. But when the presentation of what you look like now begin to show off things and begin to gender the wrong ideas to those inside the body and it begins to promote the wrong things that should not be promoted. In other words, when you become godly ladies, Paul said you ought to dress godly now. Mm -hmm. In other words, everything ain't got no business being out. Glory and grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ now, where you was once uncovered, now you are covered. Uh -huh. Where you were once unchaste, now you are chased. In other words, you are at a place to now where you are not easily a revolving door for everybody. Am I making sense? Yes. So Peter goes on to say in this third chapter, verse 18, he says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. He said, listen, I want you to understand that you have to continue growing. It cannot ever stop. Just because you now have grown from being a liar because you started practicing the truth does not mean lying completely stopped. Because as long as you are in this natural flesh, you're subject to lie again. Come on, y'all. Right. Don't get quiet on me. You're right. Mm -hmm. Go to 1 John chapter 1. And then I'm going to take you to Colossians. Go to 1 John chapter 1. John's first epistle. His first letter to the church. The evangelistical writer. John wrote to the world. He wrote to the Bible. He wrote so that the believer would understand that here it is, that even though you're saved, even though you're walking in the newness of life, even though you're following after Christ, even though you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, he wanted us to understand that calling to the flesh, you're still subject. You still struggle. See, some of us do not want to acknowledge the fact that we still have some struggles in our flesh. Some of us don't want to admit to ourselves that we still have some desires towards certain things that we engaged in and that we love before we profess with our mouth, believed in our heart, and accepted Christ to come in. Am I right about it, somebody? Y'all right. talk to me because here it is 15 years later, here it is 5 years later, here it is 5 months later, here it is 5 days later, and you've accepted Jesus Christ and you're wondering why you still have a desire to to go find some crack cocaine. You still have a desire. You're married. Are you in a committed relationship with a man or a woman? And you still having cravings to be with somebody else other than the one that you're with. And you decided that y'all set a date to go down the road and marry. But you still want another man. And you got a man already that you're getting ready to marry. You got a woman and that you're getting ready to marry. But you still desire to live with somebody. Come on, y'all talk to me. You still got cravings. You still got hungers. You still got desires. I've heard often in the Christian dome. I've heard often in the Christian wall. People say you got to starve out these desires. You got to starve the flesh. Well, you can starve the flesh for so long, but what have you put in place of that desire for the hunger that you got there? Have you fed the flesh something that now will now remove the hunger from that? Have you sat down with the man that you're dating and that you have now committed yourself to? Have you sat down with the woman that you now are dating and that you have committed yourself to? Have y'all sat down with like-mindedness to find out a way of being able to build each other up mentally, morally, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, consciously, subconsciously, so that you can wear off these areas that you at a place that caused you to now want to gravitate out to somebody else. What is it that's bringing you to the place that feels like, that make you feel like, or you have a desire to want to go out? This is not the way that God first gave it to me, so I'm going to follow the way the Spirit is going. So don't think I'm going off task. These attributes of growing in grace now brings you to the place that you learn that you have some desires that you want to have. Look what First John said. Look what he said. Let's start at verse number uh, 5. He says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So if we go back to the Gospel of John chapter 3, he says men love darkness because their deeds are evil, right? 
After you get down to verse 15, 16, and 17, by the time you get to verse 18 and 19, he said, listen, because he forgot so love the world that he gave, because see, everybody know that. Everybody hinge upon that. Everybody believe because they believe on the only begotten Son of God that they feel that they're entitled to eternal life. You're entitled from the belief, but in order to obtain it, you got to continue to live. you got to grow in him because you gain knowledge of him. To gain knowledge of him, you got to gain it from his word. To understand his word, let me take you to Jeremiah. Don't move from where you're at, but you can pin it down. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, he says, and I will give you pastors according to my heart to feed you with knowledge and understanding. For you to grow in grace and understand what unmerited faith is and why you got unmerited favor, and to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you need a pastor or a shepherd or a under shepherd. You need a leader that God has endowed with understanding of His Word to be able to teach you what it means and show you how to apply this knowledge to your life. Show you that when you stumble along the road and you recognize that there are still some desires to go into the club, mm -hmm. to wear club like clothes, mm -hmm. to dance club like dancers, and you're inside God's house and you call yourself dancing before God and you find yourself doing the electric slide, you're doing the boogie woogie. Come on, y'all. Wow. Can I help y'all tonight? Yes. You're doing all the world of dances, calling out and changed it, and I'm doing this dance unto the God. Now, you're gyrating in forms and in fashions that are enticing the minds of folk in the wrong manner. Right. Growing in grace recognizes the difference between a godly dance, mm -hmm. come on, y'all, a godly mind, uh -huh. a godly soul. Mm -hmm. Musicians recognize a godly card and a demonic card. What you got? Kirk recognized that there were some songs that he did that he had to go back and look at because the purpose and intent was to draw people and young people unto God, but it opened up some things that he wasn't expecting to open up, and he had to go back and correct some things to bring it to the place that the intent of what it was supposed to be was supposed to go. That intent was godly. His purpose was for godliness, but it opened up portals that brought about some things that were demonic, and he went about going and correcting what he did. So to say that it was not God, I cannot say that. But to say that when he recognized what it did, he went back and corrected that. And that's what we're supposed to do. See, that's what happened when I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that. That's what happens when you grow. When you grow in grace, grace now puts you at a place that you're not always asking God for forgiveness. Because now you have the strength because you're mature. And in maturity, you don't continue in the same thing always. You don't tell the same lie by changing how you told the lie 50 different times. Does that make sense? You don't end up in the same place all the time. By changing the route that you went to get there and now blaming all these other isolated events that got you there because you had a decision to make at the end of the day of whether or not you were going to finally go there. So now, knowledge now, you know the end result that if I make this final decision and choice based upon my situation, my circumstances, isolated events that have drawn me up to it, I'm angry and I'm upset, I'm aggravated and agitated, they'll work my nerves one time too many, they already assume that that's what I'm doing, they believe I have not changed in that area anyway, I might as well go on and do it, they think I'm I'm still involved in it anyway. They're associating me with what I'm doing anyway. I might as well do it. At the end of the day, you don't have to because they say so. Mm -hmm. Is that making sense? So knowledge applied says you can think what you want, but I ought to know who I am. And because you should know who you are in Christ, that goes back to the text when he said men love darkness because the deeds are evil. When the light comes, which is the word of God, when the word of God is really in your life, Remember we went to David and David said thy word that I hid in my heart, Psalm 119, that I might not sin against God. When that word is really inside your heart, your mind, when you really applied it. In other words, you've retained it. You've held on to it. You've actually made sure that you have understood what it said and you remembered the word so that when you find yourself in the situation of sin, I hear you, Holy Ghost. 
First Corinthians, I believe it is, chapter number 10. I believe it is verse number 11, 12, 13 or something like that. He said there's no temptation that is not taken man and is not common to man whereby God is faithful to give him a way of escape. See, here's the thing. As you're growing in grace, God knows that you're going to be tempted by something as long as you're in the flesh, whether you're saved or not. Right. He already know that's going to happen. But in your salvation, what takes place, God is banking on the fact that the Christ that lives in you, the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, is now going to raise up in you. Because that's why John said somewhere in the fourth chapter of this first epistle, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So if God is the greater by the word of God, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, he said, now unto him that is able... To do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think whereby the power that working in us, the attributes of grace now, is activated because now when we activate faith, we stand on faith because we now speak the word of faith that now enlightens or shed light on our life, light on our situation, light on our circumstance, light on the condition or the place where we are. Y'all talking to me. Is that making any sense? Because see, attributes go deeper than what we started last week. So why we started off in Isaiah chapter 1? Because God said the reason why your land is the way it is is because I gave you my word and my word is there, but you're doing it your way. And I'm going to get back to Isaiah as soon as I finish with this real quick. Now, I need y'all to keep talking to me because let's go on. He said in, in, in that fifth verse, he said, because there's no darkness in him when the light is there, right? He said, this then is the message. What message? The message of Jesus Christ. He says that we have heard. We've heard about Jesus, him coming down. We walk with him. We talk with him. We sit under the same stars. We ate at the same table. We watched him break bread. We watched him heal a man hand that was with him. We watched him raise up the dead. We, we, we saw him change water into wine. What? Right? Right. We saw this man walk on the wall. We saw him get up out of sleep with corn in his eyes and tell the elements to sit down and be still. And everything had to listen at what he had to say. By one word, he simply said, leave it all shut up. Because he's the controller of everything, right? right? So he says, in him there is no darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. Listen to what he means. If we say we live in Christ, we say we're growing in grace, and we say that we're growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but we still allowing sin to have power over us. Mm -hmm. I want y'all to pay Romans chapter 6. Write it down. Because look what John said. John said, if we say we have fellowship, how can I say that me and, and, and Bobby are friends? And we only friends when we're together. We laugh and we talk and I don't say nothing bad about Bobby while we're together. But when me and Bobby ain't together, I'm letting everybody say anything and everything they want about Bobby and I'm agreeing with it. I'm going along with it. How can I say that this woman is my wife and I'm dogging her when we ain't together? I'm talking about how bad she is. I'm talking about what she ain't good at. Come on, y'all talk to me. Mm -hmm. But that's my wife. You saying it's your husband. Just because you know something ain't right with them, things ain't going good with y'all, you don't give the enemy power to destroy y'all and then say it's their fault when it ain't no longer together. Right. Come on, y'all. He says, so if we, what does that have to do with it? Okay, let me dispel that. I, I hear you, Holy Ghost. For those that say that ain't got nothing to do with growing in grace and growing in knowledge. Well, here, here there are some folks that only believe God as long as God, through Christ and in Christ and because of Christ, is causing blessings to come. What happens when it seems like it's tarrying too long? See, see, you got a lot of folks, we have fellowship with God as long as things are going well, as long as nobody bothers, as long as nobody talking about it, as long as the church is growing, as long as we got the money coming in, as long as people are coming into the church, as long as they show up on Sunday, show up for our programs. Come on, come on. Come on. Lord, if they sow in season, they are paying our way for everything. We believe God. We know Jesus is doing everything. Everything is going good. But growing in grace, he said, if we have fellowship with him, we don't walk in darkness. So now what happens when it don't look like tithes are coming in? What, it, what happens when it don't look like the offering is coming like it should? What, what it look like when people don't come to church as they used to come to church? They ain't showing up for Bible class like they used to show up for Bible class. We need service and all the programs that you got going on. You would put out all of the Flyers and posts and you done everything radio, TV and everything else. And then you ain't got but four or five folks that show up. Right. 
Now you're figuring out ways. Now you're taking the word and twisting what Jesus said by the highways and the edges and compel men. Now you're compelling the wrong way because now you're starting to sell stuff to get folk to come in. Uh -huh. That's called the walking dog. Is that my maker says now? Yes. Well, my husband ain't talking to me like I wanted to talk to me, so now you start getting on sites. Uh oh. She, she, she ain't being bothered with me, so now you got all of these other friends. I'm using myself, y'all, because see, sometimes we allow inside noises to cause outside influences to be added on as outside attachments that now become inside attachments, and we don't even realize they've attached themselves on the inside. From the outside, they've attached themselves on the inside. So now where we were going in the relationship, in the marriage, or the coming marriage, or the coming ministry that we're a part of, we allow outside influences to become inside attachments and the growth that we had now and the fact where we were maturing now has just went out the window. Uh-oh. I hear you, Holy Ghost. That was hot off the press. Y'all should have caught that. So John says in verse 6, he says, if we say that we have fellowship with him, how can we say we have fellowship with God? How can we say we have fellowship with the Lord? We was excited when we first came. Jesus gave, he gave the power. He said, here's the power of the soil of seeds. He sold some on good ground, some on stony ground. I don't want to sound like I'm preaching tonight. I need y'all to talk back to me. Wow. Because see, you're growing in grace. See, some people excitedly come because it has the feeling of what they want. Mm -hmm. It's sure everything that I had. But then in the night, there's something else I can get while I'm back. Because mm -hmm. something caught my attention. Mm -hmm. But my whole purpose was to get my agenda across while I work the mission, the vision, and the purpose that God gave. But what I'm really trying to do is attach mine to it. Right. And do it the way I've always done or the way I've been allowed to do it. But now I gotta stop being resistant because I recognize I can't get over over here. Right. Come on, y'all, talk to right. me. You got fellowship. See, fellowship means you're in one call. Mm -hmm. You're in the same mind, Paul said, First Corinthians chapter one, verse ten. There are no schism. There is no division. There can't be division because when you try to come, because you're thinking in the same pattern, you're thinking for the same things, you're going in the same direction. You have your mind, they have their mind, but the ultimate purpose is God's glory, God's honor, and you're doing it for the glory of Jesus Christ, and you're not trying to promote yourself, you're not trying to get everything seen for yourself, and you're in good everybody to give you some praise because they call your name out. Uh -huh. Come on, y'all. Here's the thing. He said, if we say that we have fellowship, do we really have fellowship with Christ? Because if we have fellowship with Christ, would he lead us to, per to people or lead people to us or lead us to a ministry that we prayed and asked God for? Then we already recognize that, first of all, there are going to be some things that will come up. There will be some things that will happen. But if God has led us there, then we ought to be asking God after he led us there, now show us what am I to do? What is my purpose? Amen. I know you call me into certain parts of ministry, but what role will the ministry you gave me play at the ministry you have led me to? Uh -huh. To go and embrace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God may have called you to a certain ministry or gave you a certain ministry and anointing, but you cannot go in driving your ministry and anointing or the ministry you came in. You got to allow God to fit you into the ministry while you let God show the ministry to the minister uh -huh. that he placed the angel of the house That's right. over the ministry. What does that have to do with growing in grace? See, when you're growing in grace and in knowledge, you ain't going to think people trying to hold you back. You ain't going to think people trying to hold you down. They're trying to grow you and mature you. Right. They're trying to build you because wherever you was at, you kept bouncing around. You didn't sit down long enough. You didn't plant yourself. You didn't allow God to plant you. Uh -huh. Every time he got ready to plant you, you uprooted yourself uh -huh. before God. Uh, see, thank you, Holy Ghost. See, here's the problem. Some folk uprooted themselves before God uprooted them. God wasn't ready to up plant you. Now, let me let me put it to you like this here. You transplanted yourself before God was ready to transplant you from the pot. You didn't stay in the pot that you was in long enough for your roots to really to grow out and be able to gain the strength that they needed so that the trunk of the plant would have the strength to be pulled from one ground and put in another. Right. The reason why you didn't last in all of the ministries you were in was because you didn't stay in the ground that you came out of the first time long enough to gain 
seems soon to be uprooted and replanted somewhere else. Right. And then here's the thing. You didn't allow the gardener to be the one to uproot you to do the transplanting. You did the transplanting on your own. Uh-huh. Am I making sense to anybody? Yeah. See, that's what happens when you grow in grace and grow in knowledge. Because you figure out how you're to fit, where you fit, what is my fit? Am I really fitting here or did I come here because I saw something that could be beneficial to me? Mm -hmm. And even if you did and your whole purpose was really to grow in the Lord, then God would have fitted you to the ministry that you went to. Right. Because God has a purpose. All things still work together for good for them that love the Lord and that are called. Are called those that are called. Not everybody are called according to God's purpose. Not everybody is a part of the purpose of God. But God will fit them to the purpose because his purpose is to build his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Verse number seven to get to the part that I was talking about because see, some folk as you grow in grace, you you go you gonna learn how to practice the truth. It doesn't mean you ain't gonna stop lying. You gonna learn how not to lie so much, and you ain't gonna lie as often as you did. And it's gonna get to the place that everything that come out of your mouth will be the truth. But will you lie again? Yeah, but you can't beat yourself up because you told a lie. You gotta now after you told that lie, get yourself back in line, back with the truth. Right. Come on, y'all. Right. Because you saved now, you ain't running around now, you got your flesh under control, you still have a desire to live with a man, and you ain't got a man in your life, but you want a man, and the man that you want, you ain't got him yet, so you're awaiting your turn, but you ain't letting everybody know that you're slipping and getting what you want every once in a while, and you're doing what you got to do to take care of your, come on y'all, uh oh, somebody gonna hear that, we gonna walk on the devil tonight, Wow. we gonna walk on him tonight. So here in the text, he says, but if we walk in the light as he is, well, let me, let me finish verse number, uh, verse number six. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. We can't say that we have fellowship in Christ. We can't say that the light of the word of God is living in us. We can't say that the word of God is in us because he's going to light our path. He said he's a light unto our path, right? Mm -hmm. He's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, right? right? In other words, even unsaved folk have enough sense to recognize, just like saved folk know, that God will put light there. In other words, he will show you where you're going. He will show you who you're dealing with. He will show you what you're dealing with. He will show you why you're dealing with it. And it's up to you. You whether or not when he show you how to come out of what you're dealing with, whether or not you're going to walk down the path to get out. Right. Uh-oh. See, growing in grace now helps you to understand that while you're coming out of this and when you're walking away from it, that there will be some remnants that go along with it. There's going to be some suffering. There's going to be some hurt. There's going to be some ramifications. There's going to be some residue. You're going to want to go back. You're going to want to try to figure out how to still have an enjoyment with it, have a piece of it, have a taste of it. Ask me about it. Come on, y'all. Y'all talk to me tonight, even in our children. You, you can stop them from doing what they're doing. Tell them why they shouldn't be doing it. Give them an understanding in it. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you do, the punishment that you give, the discipline that you bring, even if you give chest tired or whatever form the chest tired it is, because they enjoy what they were doing, the pleasure of it, just to know that I can go back and do it again. I'm going to try it one more time. I'm willing to sacrifice my body. I'm willing to lose the thing that I got because I enjoyed what I was doing. That's the sin for nature, y'all. Come on, y'all talk to me. Y'all help me teach tonight. Is this making any sense to anybody other than me? He says, we lie and do not the truth. How we do not the truth? Well, Paul said to the church at Rome, chapter 7, he said, I find then that there is a law, that every time I attempt to do good, evil is ever present. He said, with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. He said, listen, in spite of the fact of me knowing what the word of God says, in spite of the fact of me meeting Jesus on the road of Damascus and him giving me instructions, and now I'm understanding why I was able to understand what the law really meant, and now make an application and recognizing that what I thought I was living according to the law, I didn't even know what I was doing. Well, I thought I was living right, I was living wrong. See, when you grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, you recognize that what you thought you were doing right, you're going to find out it wasn't right at all. What you thought you were doing it all the way right, you're going to find out that there were some things that you weren't doing quite right. Mm -hmm. And what you thought was wrong, you're going to find out was right. Uh -huh. Come on, y'all. 
So John says, he says with Paul, he says, in order for me to do the truth, I got to first of all recognize some, some of the attributes of worldly grace. I recognize that my mind is what keep my flesh from doing wrong. But in order for my mind to keep my flesh from doing wrong, it's got to be renewed daily. Mm -hmm. In order for it to be renewed daily, I got to have a refreshing of the word of God. Right. I got to have an ingesting of the word of God. I got to have an implantation of the word of God. And then I got to apply the word of God. Verse number seven, he says, but if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship one with one another. So listen, we can't say that we in Christ. And here it is. I, I didn't wrong my brother. My brother didn't wrong me. I didn't wrong my sister. My sister didn't wrong me. And now we recognize what it is. And we done left the church. We done left the local assembly. We're no longer a part of it. And we, we can't stand to see each other no matter where we go because of what have transpired, what have happened. We're saved though. We're sanctified. We got the word of God in us. See, when you grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't break off from your brothers and sisters just because they harm you. Just because they hurt you just because they sinned against you. Right. Or we were dating each other and he was dating her while he was dating me and no longer we were together. He ain't saying, she ain't saying, but look at here, you remember what you're like, now you're a dog. Come on, y'all. Wow. Uh-oh. If we got the light of the Lord in our life, this ain't for my purpose, this is for the purpose of the body. Growing in grace, recognize, oh, we used to be married, now we ain't got no business because we as leaders teach folk that now that you're divorced, you ain't got no business having a relationship with your ex-wife or your ex Uh-oh. Mm. This is what we teach y'all. Paul says that if the two can't be reconciled, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He said, let the two depart a brother or sister, for God had brought them unto their peace. In other words, as husband and wife, there were certain things that husband and wife had entitlement to, that had privileges to. They were able to come together in certain ways that brothers and sisters can't. So now Paul said to Titus that we ought to look at the younger women as sisters indeed, and the younger men as brothers indeed, the older men as fathers, and the older women as mothers. So now if we're no longer married because there was no way that we could satisfy our differences when we depart out of the marriage and divorce then I see you as my sister, I see you as my brother, I no longer should have a desire to lay with you as I did before. So those fleshly desires I had, I got to bring them in subjection. How do I do that? Growing in grace now, the Bible says, Paul says to the church at Corinth again, his second letter recorded, his third letter written, he says in the 10th chapter, he says, listen, that we got to cast down every imagination that it exalted itself above the knowledge of God. So now, how do I get rid of these hunters? How do I get rid of these desires? When these things come up, i got to now pronounce the word over it, and i got to apply the word to it so that I can now cast it down. i got to bring it in subjection. i got to take authority over it. I can't just say, well, oh, I can't think like that no more. Let me make sure I ain't around them. I can't hang around them because every time I'm around them, something just happened on the inside of me. We can't be in the same place. That's why I can't go to the same church. No, what you don't want to do is bring it in subjection. What you don't want to do is bring it out and cut it under control. Come on, y'all. And like some folk, you just don't want to stop hating folk because you want to hate them. So as long as they're around, you can't hate them. As long as you don't see them, as long as their name don't come up, you ain't got no problem with them. But let somebody bring up so so name. Mm -hmm. Even in our families. Yes. I'm trying to help y'all about growing in grace because see, that's where malice come in. That's where resentfulness come in. That's where strife come in. That's where bitterness come in. But when you grow in grace, you now know how to control these things because your emotions do not override the Spirit of God. Let's go back to Paul again. Paul said to the church at Galatia, chapter 5, verse 16, he said, if we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? John says, if we got fellowship with God in Christ, mm -hmm. if we got fellowship with Christ, he is light. He will give us the light. He will give us understanding. Mm -hmm. He will help us recognize how to deal with that emotion. Right. Here's the thing. Anger is the same way because you are in control of your thoughts while you get in anger. Mm -hmm. All this junk where I'm mad. Well, when you're mad, you lost control. But here's what they found scientifically, psychologically, and socially. You still have some cognitive control of what you're doing. Right. Uh-oh. So here John says, 
because we're growing in grace and in knowledge. See, knowledge now gives you power. Where you remain powerless is that you don't apply the knowledge. See, Paul said, you, you ever gain the knowledge but never coming because you're denying the power thereof. There are a lot of folk that study the word of God. They got knowledge of the word, but they ain't got no power in it. The reason why there's no power, because the spirit of God that lives in the word, that spoke the word, that breathed the word, that inbreathed the word, that still breathes in the word, does not render the power that's needed because they don't apply it to their life. Right. If you're hungry and they got food in your kitchen, and you won't go get it because you have been asked if you wanted something to eat. And because your mama, your daddy, your grandma, your grandfather didn't fix it for you, you mad at them and you hungry. You know I'm hungry. Why you ain't fixing me nothing to eat? You a rage. Mm -hmm. You got the power to get off your behind, uh -huh. walk in the kitchen, and fix you something to eat. Could have fooled that. Right? Mm -hmm. Now you, four or five years old, you ain't got the trust that they would like to have in you. So it's their responsibility to make sure that it's fixed. Right. It's your responsibility to make sure that it's eaten. Mm -hmm. right? right? By the time you reach 7 to 16, you should be at a place where they can trust you enough to go put you a piece of meat on some bread. Right. Come on, y'all, talk right. to me. See, growing in knowledge, I see what you are capable of doing. I see the level that you're on mentally. I see where you are in maturity. So I know what I can trust you in. Right. Growing in grace and in the knowledge, God knows where he can trust you at in his kingdom. He knows what level and how many folk he can handle you with. He can allow you to handle. I see some folk will try to mandate that you can't handle a whole lot because they don't see a whole lot there. That's because there's some folk resisting to do what God said do because they want to be able to put out that you can't. Uh -huh. But in actuality, God has given you the control over millions. Yes. But folk don't want you to see that That's you have. Right. So John goes on in verse 7. Am I making any sense to anybody? Mm -hmm. Come on, need y'all talk back to me. Yes. Yeah. He said, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, John said he was the light of men. Mm -hmm. And then that same light, that same word, was made flesh. Mm -hmm. And he dwelt among men, right? right? Jesus said the reason why in the Gospel of John, between chapter 1 and chapter 17, he said the reason why the world got mad at him, because he came and he lighted up the world. And because he was the light of the world, he brought light in the world. In other words, he shined the light on where they were wrong at. Because see, when you grow in grace, you understand that you don't deserve to be alive because of what you did. See, here, here's the thing. If we were still living under the law, there's a whole lot of stuff that none of us, for Bible classes across the world, mm -hmm. convocations and all of this other stuff that they're doing. I hear you, Holy Ghost, we're getting ready to go there. So I want you to turn your Bible back to Isaiah chapter 1. We're first going to go back to Isaiah chapter 1 because I'm going to get out of John real quick because i got to go there. See, we hold all of these things across the world. If we were doing what God said do, then our condition in our world would be a little bit better than what it is because the application of the word would not just be for those that are part of our fellowship. See, we only fellowship with those that are like-minded like us, mm -hmm. or that we have pressed to be like-minded like us, or we have bewildered or bewitched to be like-minded like us, or what we have done, we've convinced them to believe what we want them to believe, while they're struggling with what they're believing that we believe, when they know what the truth really is. Oh, oh. said a mouthful, didn't it? Uh -huh. In other words, they know what truth really is, but because this look like it's good and it look like it's glory, and everybody look like they're flocking to it, they're going to flock to what they think is going. Jesus said, broad is the road, and many that be that traveler. But straight is the way, narrow is the gate, and few that be that traveler, right? Uh -huh. that, that's what he said in the Gospels, right? Check chapter 5 all the way to chapter number 8 of the Gospel of Matthew, right? Uh -huh. His Sermon on the Mount. Because, see, people like to go where it look like it's growing. Uh -huh. But they don't go nowhere when they ain't got but two or three four. That's right. Because it don't look like it's going nowhere. Because what we have done, we have set folk mind to believe that growth is predicated off the car, the clothes, the money, the number of people that's there. Let me help us understand, growth is predicated off of this one thing. I don't want you to check the principle yourself. Have you really taken the knowledge you've got and applied it to your life? And once you made the application of that knowledge to your life, what have caused a change in your life that now have reciprocated a cause, a ripple from your life, to now go out and somebody else and made them change? Mm -hmm. When you see the change in yourself, in the things that you were doing, 
Not just the fact that now I want you to understand, a part of both is numbers. Right. But if you go into numbers and you ain't got no strength and you're still dealing with the mindsets of both that are still immature, then what good to do to have numbers? Because when it's time to go to war, don't nobody know how to pray. Uh -uh. Don't nobody know how to praise. Yeah. If you got a church of only folk that know how to give money, but don't nobody know how to call upon the name of the Lord, then what do you got? You got a finance business that's all it is is finance, but it don't know how to deal with the mental trouble and anguish that's getting ready to come. Right. Look at Isaiah chapter 1, where we open up tonight. He said, your country is desolate. The reason why some of our ministries, the reason why some of our homes, the reason why some of our relationships are as desolate as it is and seem like it's been consumed, seem like our cities, seem like it got a bunch of fire, and seem like strangers have overtaken it, is because we have not applied the principles of what God has given us concerning his word. Mm -hmm. Except God ever ran to that. Somebody in the family got saved. Somebody in the family been praying. Somebody in the family is still telling the truth. Somebody is still telling you that there is a reality in serving the truth of the living God. Somebody telling you that Jesus Christ, yeah, he came. My mama used to say it like this here. When we were kids and we act like we ain't want to get our heads together, didn't seem like we wanted to do the right thing, she said, you ain't going to believe Christ rolled through Cicero or a duck it because you wouldn't let us see it. Some folk won't believe that Jesus Christ came down in the flesh, died by the flesh, rose with a glorified flesh, stayed for 40 days before going back to heaven. Right. Come on, y'all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where a man walked the Bible, where well, he been now where God told him to write. And there were some shifts and changes because there were some church fathers that shifted some words for their purpose. Uh -huh. Come on, y'all, talk to you me. Glory and grace, what does that have to do with it? He said, he said, look, some of y'all just like Sodom and some of y'all just like Gomorrah. Look at the day in which we live now. The morality of man have changed. We done changed morality from being right to being wrong. And immorality, it was in it was right. Listen, let me help us understand. God loved the alcoholic just like he loved the homemonger. He loved the homemonger just like he loved the homosexual. But here's the thing. The thing about it is that each one got to come out of the sin that they're in. Right. He loved the adulterer just like he loved the fornicator. Well, you was an adulterer, you ain't going into heaven. Well, preacher, well, pastor, let me help you understand. You fornicated before you got married. Some of y'all was adulterers before you stopped being an adulterer. And because you stopped, that gives you the right to go to heaven because you're no longer committing adultery. Uh-oh. But some of y'all committing spiritual adultery. Mm -hmm. And you think because you stop physical adultery. You think because you stop spiritual fornication. You think because you stop being drunk physically. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. You think because you are no longer being in a homosexual relationship, you still sleeping with other gods. Uh-oh. Oh, Jesus. Uh-oh. He said, you calling all of these assemblies together. He said, did I tell you to do it? He said, you bringing all of these sacrifices and telling all these folk to run and bring this here. Mm -hmm. It's good to talk about destiny and dreams. That's good. That's a purpose. God said it. Mm -hmm. But are we telling folk the first part and the first purpose of it is to now begin to live a life that's pleasing unto God because we have disciplined ourselves. See, we can teach people to discipline themselves to make sure their dreams and vision go forward, to make sure that their business and purpose go where it's supposed to go. But have we taught them how to discipline themselves in their flesh that sin don't easily creep back in? No. Uh-oh. Here's the thing. He said, wash and make you clean. Mm -hmm. Growing in grace brings us to the place that God gives us a new heart. When he gives us a new heart, you can go in Ezekiel chapter 35, and he told them there that he was going to take away their stony heart and give them a heart of flesh. Mm -hmm. You can read it for yourself. The reason why God said it is because we become hard-hearted in what we're doing because of what we've been through. The reason why some women won't date another man or when they get in a relationship with a man or why some men won't date another woman or when they get in a relationship with another woman and even engage in the thing of marriage, they still keep walls up. They still have areas that have not been broken down. And they keep these areas up because they're still protecting themselves, but they trust God. Mm, Jesus. If I keep this up, if I let them in again, 
As long as you're in the flesh, let me help us all know relationship one-on-one. Here's my relationship one-on-one. As long as you're in the flesh and you continue to decide to date until Jesus come back again and establish the world the way God wanted to be like it was supposed to be in the beginning before Adam sinned in the garden, before he kicked them out of the garden and gave them the start to come back to him by killing the first animals that were in the garden and giving them the first blood sacrifice covering the sins that they did. Until that happened again, when you get into relationships, you will find yourself dealing with some of these same things. But you got to be willing to let go to move forward because the next person you deal with is not like the last person you just was with. What you got? They did it because they was convinced of owning something that they didn't own. Let me put it like this. So let me rephrase it. They were convinced that what they had wasn't theirs and they owned it already. And they were told a lie by being told the truth in a different way. They watered down the truth. In other words, they knew the fruit was good. They knew the fruit was beautiful. They knew the fruit was to be desired. But they was told that it wasn't. They were told a lie. They were told that they would be gods like God. And they didn't realize that they were because they was made in the image and the likeness of God. They were fooled into believing that they wasn't something where they already were. Thank you, Holy Ghost, because you got to know who you are when people will try to make you think that you're not. If you don't know who you are and you don't know your identity, I can make you believe you to be whoever I want you to be. And if I manipulate your mind enough, I can make you do whatever I want you to do. That's what's happening in the body of Christ. That's why we have all these multiple churches that are coming up. And while they're coming up, they're pitting themselves against the church. And that's why the church hasn't become the church. Right. So Adam and Eve in the garden did what they did because I'm going to say like they said back in my day, they were sold a wolf ticket. In other words, I sold you your car and you already owned it. I stole it from you and you didn't even realize it. But I made you buy back what you already owned. And when they did that, they lost the privilege that they had. Why? Because Satan already knew the plan of God was to create Adam and Eve. But here's the thing. He created him to do the job that he was getting ready to lose because he got beside himself. And he thought by trying to put them out of the position that they had been put in to take his position that they would lose it. But he didn't realize that they had it for ever. They was given it eternally. And even though they lost their position in the garden, he didn't realize God had already made it for them to come back to the garden. Does that make sense to you? I saw your hand, what you got? Yeah, I was going to say, that, but that happened over a period of time. That's what tend to happen with us, is that we get fed stuff over a period of time. It's not something that happened overnight. Exactly. And I'm glad you said that because, see, when people read the text, they literally think that as soon as the serpent said what he said to Eve, immediately he got out of fall. No. If you look at the text, the text would suggest that it happened immediately. No. He had to watch her for a while. I'm glad you because that's what happened to us. See, when temptation comes, it tempts you. But do you fall immediately to the temptation? It's got to draw you in. First of all, before you're tempted, it's got to get your attention. Satan was the chief music, well, Lucifer, what his name was in heaven, the son of the morning or the day star. He was the brightest thing. He's the one that shined. He took the glory of God just like the Son of God had God's glory. He had a part of God's glory. So here now, he had to use the greatest gift he had. So he had to use the thing that she was enticed by, that she looked at. The serpent didn't crawl on the ground. But it was beautiful. When it says Sata, it was beautiful. It was something that was fascinating. It caught the eye. It caught her eye. She watched it. Some historians will say that the animals was able to talk before Adam and Eve did what they did. I can't really tell you if that's a yay or nay because I really don't know, so I'm not going to divulge in that. Maybe they did or maybe they didn't, but the serpent was able to talk because see what happened was he embodied, Satan embodied the serpent. The word Satan means adversary or against or fight. That's all the word Satan means. So here now, to get to Adam, he had to go through the opposite side of him. Because he couldn't go to Adam. When he was right there, Adam was doing what God told him to do, kill the God. So whether Adam was five feet away from Eve, he wasn't there while the serpent was talking because had the husband been there, he would have stopped the conversation, but it went over a period of time. Mm -hmm. See, people get in your ear when you're not around the folk that's got the strength to stop. Mm -hmm. Because see, had he been there when it was said, he would have stopped. 
But she even didn't continue the conversation. She listened at it while she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Had the woman just stood the ground. And see how you know that she knew what was said? Because she repeated to him, but repeated the opposite to him. God never told her not to touch the fruit. Because in order for Adam to keep the garden up, he had to touch the fruit of the garden. He told him not to eat of it. See, and that's the thing. You got to know the word for yourself. You got to know what truth is. That's why the light is there and you grow in grace and in knowledge. Can't nobody fool you when it comes to the word of God. Can't nobody fool you when you know what God is saying and what God is telling you to go because you growing and knowledge keeps you enlightened. And not only does it keep you enlightened, but it empowers. While it empowers, it leads. While it leads you, it helps you to live. Right. That's why he said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It won't allow you to be entangled and in bondage. And if you find yourself entangled and in bondage, when you realize and sit down and think about what the truth of the word of God is, that knowledge now will stand up and empower you to come out. You will break the bonds of bondage. You will break the chains of imprisonment. Does that make sense to anybody? So when we look at this thing tonight, you're right. It took a period of time, and that's what happened to us. You, you, you're right, woman of God. It, it, it happens over a period of time. Do our children get in trouble right away? Mm -mm. Or they find something to get in trouble with? Okay. Or they wait until you're nowhere around to do the thing? Because they know if you're there, they can't do it, right? Right. They're going to try you every once in a while in front of you. Mm -hmm. But when they realize they can't get away with it in front of you, they know they got to figure out a way to do it when you ain't around. Mm -hmm. And even though you're in the same house with them, they got to do it when you ain't in the same room or close to the room where they are, right? Right. But see, what they do, they ain't going to do it all. They're going to do it little bit by little bit because they don't want you to notice what they're doing. Right? Right. Every last one of us have done that. You know why? Because they go back to the garden and our sinful nature. When Adam and Eve finally came together, that bloodline of sin passed down to all of us. But now the bloodline of righteousness came to all of us when Christ died, when he got up. Right? Right. The moment we accepted him and recognized that we needed him, when we started growing in him because of his word, when the word grow in us, it becomes better. If you don't water your grandmother flowers, what are they going to do? Burn. Now, if you give them too much light, what are they going to do? Burn. Exactly. Burn and die. But here's the good thing about the word. You can't have too much of the word. But as you get more of the word, you got to apply it. You take a sponge and put water in it, after a while, that sponge can't hold but so much water. It becomes saturated and it becomes super saturated. The reason why when it rains too much and water lay on top of the ground is because the ground absorbs as much water as it can. So that's why you have puddles of water on the ground because the ground becomes super saturated. So it's going to take a few days for it to absorb the rest of the water. Same thing like the sponge. When you study the word of God, you got to allow yourself to absorb some of what you have read, some of what you have learned. How do I absorb it? I absorb that by applying it to my life. I got to add The principles that we learn from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade, whether we go to college or not, we have to apply that every day even before we walk across the stage and receive our diploma. Because every day mathematics is being used. Every day science is being used. Applied science, physical science, earth science, right? right. Physics is used every day. History is being played out every day, right? Right. English is used every day. Simple English, modern English, right? The parts of speech that we deal with, the eight parts of speech, we got to use them every day. So when we look at growing in grace under the knowledge of Jesus Christ, we got to build some things up. That's why he said here in Isaiah, God promised that he would wash us. That's what he said to Israel. I'm going to wash you. I'm going to make you white as snow. I'm going to make you white like wool. But here's the thing that helps it to be there. When you're growing in grace and in the knowledge, you got to be willing to be obedient. Right. How many tonight when you're growing in the knowledge of God is obedient to apply it? See, it's one thing to have it. It's one thing to know it. It's one thing to read it. It's one thing to remember it. It's another thing to apply it in obedience. Right. 
Because see, there's a lot of folk that know to do right. James said, Jesus' brother said, to him to know to do good and do it not is sin. You know what I mean? If folk know to love folk the right way, know to stop hating folk, know to forgive folk and don't forgive them, but they love the Lord. They say God heard their cry, they own their way to heaven. Jesus is their rock. They've been in worship. If you've been in worship before God, you can't come out of worship still hating folk. Right. If you've been praising God, the folk that you was carrying on with, when you come out, you going to get it straight. That's growing in grace. Uh -huh. That's growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The folk you had a bad relationship with, your ex-wife, your ex-husband, whether they accept it or not, your ex-girlfriend, the one that you were sleeping with and you broke it off with, you going to go ask for forgiveness whether they want to forgive you or not. Now, if they say what's going to happen, the Spirit of God going to deal with them. Now, whether they be obedient to receive it or not is left on them. And they're going to get left out and miss the blessings of God. Because now they're going to go out putting their mouth against you the wrong way. Uh-oh. I'm trying to leave it alone. Because, see, when you're building up a spiritual house, that's another thing when you grow in grace. Because you recognize you're a royal priesthood. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. Remember we talked about that last week? See, when you're part of the royal priesthood and you grow in grace and grow in knowledge, he said here, he don't want no more bullocks. That's what he said in Isaiah chapter 1, right? Verse 11. He, he said, I don't want no more burn off as a rams. He said, I don't even want the fed feast, the beast. He, he said, I don't even want the light in the, in, in the blood of bullocks and the lambs and the goats. He said, when you appear before me, your hands are dirty. He said, y'all coming before me, raising your hand. You praising me, and you can't stand Red. You can't stand John. You can't stand Billy. You can't stand Bob. You can't stand Sally. You can't stand Sam. Come on, y'all. You can't stand Sue. Uh -huh. Jill will work your nerve. Jill will work in your nerve. Jill will accept with your man, and you can't forgive her. Uh-oh. They had an inappropriate conversation and you can't get over it. Uh-oh. You found some, you found some messages. And you're holding it over their head. Word and grace now, figure out how to make sure it don't happen. Again. Come on, y'all, talk to me. Uh-oh. Maybe I'm walking on some toes. Because see, when you're growing. You recognize that. I can't say, Lord, I love you. And knowing I got evil in my heart. Knowing that I, I just had an argument, but I ain't say, I'm sorry. I didn't say, hey, look, let's get this together. I, I'm going to praise is what I do. You tell me what you're going through, but, but you just cussed them out. Your mouth ain't said it, but your mind cussed them out. Uh-oh. See, growing in grace and growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, just because your mouth ain't said it, your mind said it, because in your heart, you were warring evil against them. Mm -hmm. They're talking about you, so you go and find some dirt on them. See, when you're growing and building up a spiritual house, because you're a royal priesthood, you're going to offer sacrifices of genuine praise. Genuine praise get the attention of not only the angels, but it gets God's attention. And God recognized from your prayer to your praise, you have got out of yourself. And now you get into his presence because he brought you in. And now he exchanged the rest of the stuff that you didn't realize was still there right. for some good stuff. That now give you the ability to go to them for. You know, you done got out of service and you was trying to figure out why you went to so and so. And now you want to have a conversation with them and you know you couldn't stand them. And the conversation go good because you follow what God said. And they accept your forgiveness and you was able to forgive them. And now it feel like a ton of bricks off your chest. You ain't stressed no more. You, 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 your mind seem like it's free. It, it ain't clouded no more. You ever felt like that? That's because when you've really been in the presence of God, and God has brought you in His presence in worship, there's an exchange, there's a give, and there's a take. He take your mess and give you something that is good enough to become the best, so you can go back to those folk and prove to them by your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And your words are empowered with the Spirit of God to bring conviction over them. Not by your words, but empower your words.
words to bring conviction over them that you have to be in the presence of God. Because you heard some folks say, something different about you. you. You sound different. You look different. And they're willing to accept it. Come on, y'all. Talk to me. Any comments and questions tonight? Any input tonight? Any more input, I should say. Because when you grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, you got to be willing and obedient. And then God promised that you would eat the good of the land. Not just food, but the benefit that's there. You have the keys to the kingdom. You have access to everything in the kingdom. Holistically, you have the access to everything. The good of the land, you'll see your children going up. Your children will become more obedient. I see your hand. Your children will not only be obedient, but they will not only be called blessed, but they will call you blessed. That's what the word said. Because, see, you're willing and obedient to come out of the thing that you're in. And while you're coming out, you're applying the knowledge that you gained from both the word of God and the understanding of who Jesus Christ was. And you're not selfish for what you're doing. And your motive for what you're doing is to bring honor to God through Jesus Christ as you're led by the spirit of God and empowered because of the word of God. And the willingness in that, God promised that it happened. But if you're not... God promised that when you rebel, when you refuse. See, when we refuse to do what God tells us to do, because we just don't feel like doing it, we don't want to do it. They made us mad, you done agitated me. I don't feel like praying, you pray yourself. You're going to be devoured. Not only will you reap what you sow, but you're going to be devoured in the land. You're going to start seeing things lost. You're going to be losing privileges. Doors going to be closed that were once open. It was open last week and they told you come back any time. Now you done went back and they done told you, well, I'm sorry. I know I told you that last week, but something came up. Mama promised you something. But because of your refusal to be obedient, mm -hmm. your rebellion to obedience, your unwillingness to do what God required you to do, you didn't want to pray as God said. You wanted to continue to fill your mind and your body with junk. You still wanted to play around with fire. And because the last 20 times you played with it, you didn't get scorched, you didn't smell like it, you didn't get burned, nothing got burned, now you done got burnt. Uh -huh. You got internal injuries as well as external injuries, and now you got to pay for burning somebody's house down. Uh -huh. And now you got the death of four people on you. Because just because he gave you grace, you ain't learned the 20 times before, and here the 21st time now, grace just ran out. Hmm. Am I making sense to anybody? Yeah, that's when people think God let them down. He didn't let you down, because if you think about it, he gave you 20 times 20 before times. that. He gave you five times before that. He gave you three times before that. But you chose not to hmm. follow. Hmm. What you got, baby? Grace, grace don't do anything to you. Grace is what's been given to you. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is something that you didn't earn. Grace is something you would never be able to earn. And what happens with grace is that people take for granted the fact that they live in a place. They live in a time. They live in what is called a dispensation or a period of time where, where we should die for the things we do. God has spared our life where we should be in jail for some of the things that we do but God has kept the jailer where justice should have come in and said listen you are deserving of imprisonment he has not allowed us to go to prison he has not allowed us to sit in a holding cell he has not allowed a judge to give us a sentence he has not allowed a judge to convict us or a jury to convict us for the crimes that we committed so grace says, give them another chance. Right now, our minds are not completely right and righteous before God. And grace is saying, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, saying, now look, Father, you know over 2,000 plus years ago, when I walked the earth with man in the flesh and still was in heaven with you, I died for them. I took off my omnipresence. I took off my omniscience. I took off my omnipotence. I took off my power. I, I took all of that off. I took my glory off. And I went down there in the flesh like we had created Adam. And 
and I took on the image that we made Adam in just like us and I took that same nature on just like them to show them as I gave my word through Moses for them to live by that they can follow that same word. They took my word and they began to do it how they would. In this day and time, see, grace me that because I know I can get away with a thing, I'm going to keep trying to get away with it. As long as I know I can manipulate you into believing that I'm doing the right thing or tell you the thing that you want to hear to make you believe that I'm right in what I'm doing, I'm going to do it. And God said, let me send my son. Jesus said, Daddy, I'll go. He came down. And while I'm down here, he showed us the reason why I gave certain laws was to govern us. In other words, he gave us a guideline of how not to get in trouble. And if we got in trouble, he gave us a guideline of how to get out of trouble. And in the guideline of how to get out of trouble, he showed us how to stay out of it so that we don't fall back to the same trouble again. That's what grace does. But some people think that it's all right because they got saved once before. Daddy got them in trouble, got them out of trouble. Daddy had the money. Mama had the money. Mama felt merciful. Mama felt pitiful. After a while, God allowed you since that's what you're doing. Now you got to suffer the consequences because you kept doing it. When I kept giving you the opportunity to stop, you chose not to. Is that making sense to you? People don't think about the fact that, yeah, grace can be cut off for the moment. And the consequences of grace being cut off for the moment is now dealing with the punishment that come behind the fact that grace stopped. Grace stopped us from receiving some of the punishments that we deserve. And because it stopped it at that moment, we figure that we ain't going to have to deal with it. But here's what happened with grace. Sometimes grace will have us now having to deal with the punishment that we were supposed to get beforehand and dealing with the punishment we didn't hear to get right then and there. Does that make sense? Anybody else tonight before we close out? Does this make sense anywhere along the way to y'all tonight? Amen. We thank God tonight for all of you that have been here, for each of you that have been watching tonight and all that will watch. Growing in grace, brothers and sisters, we live in this time period right now that our lifestyles should be befitting and we should be trying to restore folk. I understand that we all are capable and we all have the power to fall into sin. We all have the power to sin. But we need to spend more time picking people up. Now, some folk ain't trying to get up. Let me, let me make that clear tonight. Some folk ain't trying to get up. Some folk don't want to get up. Our world that we're living in with all the death that is going on around us, with all the murder suicides that are happening right now, the enemy is disguising a whole lot of things. Satan is disguising a whole lot of things. And people are losing their lives. Death is taking folk. Folk are making decisions to just do things. Our young people of all nationalities are losing their lives. Yep. They're getting involved in things that are not godly. Mm -hmm. And we're going about our business in church like it's no business at all. And we're having fun in our worship, in our praises, in our dances, in our fellowships, in our convocations, and all of this other stuff. But is it really benefiting the community where our churches are at? Our convocations that we're putting on, our gatherings that we're having, our revivals that we're doing, outside tent revivals, is it really causing an impact? Is it really impacting the people where we're having it at? Has it caused a shift in the minds, a shift in the atmosphere? Not just the people that we have invited out, has it caused a shift in those that have not been a partaker of it? Amen. We invite the same men and women of God to these conferences to come and teach the conferences and what have you. Are we causing an impact or is it just because the name will bring a crowd and the crowd will come and while the crowd is coming, has it affected the city, the town, the state, the neighborhood where we're doing this at? But when we leave, we're talking about how good of a time that we have had. Has it left an impactful, factual impact on that city that some of the crime, some of the emotional destroy, some of the psychological anguish, some of the mental hardship, 
some of the social economical fundamental anxieties has it changed that, those things I'm curious whether we're large or whether we're small or whether we're just starting out in the ministry that has been planted or being planted has it really caused an effect and affected the place where the ministry is at is that neighborhood where the ministry is connected to where the ministry is located at the city and the connecting cities the conjoining cities the parallel cities to it the parallel streets the conjoining streets the connecting streets have we really caused an impact as the body of Christ with the ministries that we have is the word that we really preaching and the power of the Holy Spirit that we say is flowing through the church that we are part of. We as leaders. Has it really caused an impact? Think about it. Growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just about calling in the same folk that we know or like-minded folk that have the same mind that we have looking and seeking after the same things while we rape the people from the same things that we've been getting from them all the time. What are we really putting back in them while we're telling them, we're giving them the word, we're giving them a fresh word and we're implying the word to them. Are we really giving them something that will cause them to build their life? Are we really impacting them or are we taking from them while we call ourselves giving to them? Right. We say that we show them how to get a job. We show them how to build a business, but they got to pay us to get this. Mm -hmm. What impact mm. have we really made? Are we really making? Whether we have or don't have, what impact are we making, y'all? Are we really taking care of the household of faith? while we go out and give to others first. How many in our ministries are hurting? And we have and we will give, but we'll give to the outside before we give to the inside. Amen. Amen. Large or small, y'all. Amen. I need us to think about it because growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, do we really have all things in common as the apostles did? Acts chapter four, we'll bring that up, but do we really have all things in common? Or the rich folk, as Paul so said to his son Timothy, chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, is the rich really giving into and seeding into so that everybody can have? He gives seed to the soul. We'll say that quickly. God have impressed upon people to give and people have refused to be and do what God said do because they have not been obedient and that's why they have lost but they have went somewhere else instead of going where God told them to sow the seed instead of calling who God told them to call they call somebody else and that's why the impact you were looking to have did not go the way it needed to go the word went out because it cannot go out and come back there it's going to accomplish what God said the reason why it's taking so long to accomplish that task is because whom God told you to call, what God told you to plant the seed, what God told you to sow the seed, whom God told you to sow the seed into, you chose not to, but you gave it to the one that came along. You said, since I didn't get a chance to give it to this one, I'm going to give it to the one that's here. Be obedient and do what God said do, and you won't see your harvest being devoured before it even come up. You will be looking at the rose waiting for the stalk to come out the ground. And here five weeks later, you still don't see the stalk. Mm -hmm. That's because the worm in the ground ate the seed so it wouldn't come up. God allowed it to be devoured because when he told you to plant the seed and where he told you to plant it at, you chose not to plant it. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was devoured before it even got a chance to grow. Uh-oh. That go your prophetic word for the night. Where you were supposed to plant the seed and the ground you were supposed to plant the seed in. This is growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is steadfastness. When you steadfast in what God is saying, you're going to trust where God tell you to go. You're going to trust what God tell you to sow. You're going to trust whom God told you to sow into. And you're going to believe where he told you to sow. That the moment you're obedient to sow it, soon as you release the seed into the ground where God told you to release it, I guarantee you immediately you're going to see a return on your harvest. God bless you tonight. God keep you tonight. Anybody got anything else before we close out? 
Friday night, brothers and sisters, join me in uh, Murrayville, Georgia. Those of you brothers that want to go, I have to go to Murrayville, Georgia, to Bishop uh, Eric Johnson, to his church, to Feed My Sheep uh, Ministry out in Murrayville, Georgia, to start off their men's conference uh, this Friday night. So be with me if you will. If you want to go with us, I'm going to be there for 5 o'clock. Uh, Friday night is right outside of Gainesville. Uh, this Friday night, so if you want to follow me then, uh, it would be much appreciated. On the first Sunday in August, we got to go down to uh, Macon, Georgia, uh, to Coleman Street in Macon, Georgia, for uh, Minister Patrick Action. We have to go and preach for him for 6 o'clock, so keep us in prayer. And then the following week, we'll be back in Macon, Georgia, uh, for a revival down there. So God bless you. God keep you is our prayer tonight. So if you can be with us and support us, by all means do what you know God is telling you to do and what he's leading Amen. you to do. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again. God, we bless you. We honor you tonight. God, we thank you for your presence tonight. Holy Spirit, we appreciate you speaking to us, speaking through us, speaking for us, illuminating our minds, opening up our understanding. We thank you for teaching us tonight and teaching through us tonight. We honor you tonight, Lord Jesus, for just giving us the privilege and finding us worthy enough to be able to stand in your presence, sit in your presence, to watch in your presence tonight, to receive from you tonight. We pray tonight, God, that this word has fallen on good ground, that it has fallen among ears that were willing to hear, ears that were willing to receive, minds that were willing to understand, hearts that were ready to believe even greater. Now God show us how to better apply this word. And as we make it applicable to our life, empower us with all the strength that is needed. God, as you continue to give us your grace and afford us your mercy, Lord, fill us with your love more and more. And as we learn to love each other better, as we learn to love you even more, show us how to make that love even more applicable into the lives around us. Yes. Even those that are unlovable, God, give us understanding in how to love them. Show us how to better be able to treat them as we treat you and how to treat ourselves even better. God, we give your name glory. We give your name honor and praise. Bless every member that is a part of all of these ministries. Shepherd God. God, the place of worship, God walking by faith, God's divine love. God, we pray now, God, that you will bless the prophet Nahum, God. Bless all of our ministers and all that are connected to these ministries. I pray forever give your name glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. God bless my brother now, Pastor Patrick Axiom. Bless him now in the many ways, God. Bless him now, lift him now, elevate him now, strengthen him now, God. Open his eyes, strengthen him in the ways of mercy. Give him more, eye, more knowledge, more understanding, more wisdom. Give him the direction that you called him to, God. Show him what it is that you said to do. And yeah. now God placed before him the means and the provision. Send the provider the provision that you said would be there. Yeah. That he saw the thing that you said to start. And give him the faith and strength to keep on going in spite of what has been said and what shall be said. This we pray now, decree now, and believe now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and God keep you. Join us Sunday morning for 11 o'clock here at Shepherd. We love you. Be blessed tonight. Amazing.